Okay, so this is we're going to graph an inequality. Uh, have we graphed an, in, an an equality, an equation like this before? Yes, we have. Right. If we were to just concentrate on this, <coughs> if we just concentrate on that. That would be the graph of this equation would be what? A line. A line. It would be a straight line. Let's get things rolling today. Someday you will <laughs> doubt my throwing abilities. Until she gets it. <laughs> yeah, when I go do that, I'll get it. All right, so if we were to graph the equals part, that means all of the x and y pairs that will make both sides equal. If you graph all of those as points on the plane, we'll get a line. Okay. And this is part of this, isn't it? That equals part is part of this inequality. So that's just some points that we care about, right? We care about that line. That's part of this inequality. So let's start there. And even if it wasn't, even if this equal sign wasn't there, we still want to look at this equals, this line that this equation makes uh, just as a boundary, at least, for the shaded area. Okay. So we'll find all the points that make both sides equal. Those points make a line. We know how to graph that line. Every time I graph a line or any graph, I'll keep asking me these kinds of questions, like how do I know there's a, line, a point on the y-axis? How do I know there's a point right there based on this equation? Jeff? If you plug in 0 for x, you have y is less than or equal to negative 2, so you know negative 2 is a point. So you know it's a point for this equation. This equation oh, yeah, has a point of 0, 2, zero or sorry, 0, negative 2, exactly. If I follow the slope, I go down 2 and to the right 3. Okay, well, how can I justify that with this equation? I don't know there's a point here at 3, negative 4. Plug in 1. Sean? If you plug in 3 for x, you get negative 4 for y. Plug in 3 for x, you get negative 4 for y. Yes, exactly. That's very important. It's something I really want my algebra student, my algebra 1 students, to really grasp. I don't want you to lose sight of that. A, a graph is not a scary, crazy, magical, hard to understand thing. It's just a set of points that works in this equation, or the graph we're about to graph that works not only this equation, but this inequality. Okay? <clears throat> Those points satisfy this equation, or they <coughs> satisfy or make true whatever we're working as, the equation or inequality. We know that this is going to be a line, so we can just draw the rest of the points. How many points did I just draw? Infinite, infinite number of points make up this line. Every point on the line, or really every point that's part of the line that makes up the line, what do we know about that point and this stuff up here? Justin, any point on this line? In what way? <clears throat> so I take a, a point is made of an x and a y, right? So I take that point, that x, that y. What do I do with it? What significance does it have to? You plug it in for x and y, and then it will come out to be true. True. Why would it come out to be true? Which, what would we say about both sides when we plug in an x and a y from the line? Equal. Right, equal, not unequal, right? So. It's that equals to part, right? The line, here, let's just uh, color, code th that's not color. color code this. The line is made up of a, a bunch of points, an infinite number of points that satisfy this part of the inequality, the equals to part, this thing. Right? Satisfies the equals to part. Now we need to look and find where all the are the points to satisfy the other part, the, the inequality. The greater than y, the y value, we want all the y values that are greater than what we get over here. How do we know what we get when we plug in a particular x here? Well, that's what this line is. If I plug in 0 for x, if I plug in 0 for x, what will I get on this side? Negative 2. Y is greater than or equal to no, 
I'll get negative 2 on this side. If I plug in 0, I'll get negative 2. Right? Yeah. On this side. On this side, I'll get negative 2. Okay. Well, if I choose this point, that point makes both sides equal. If I choose this point, what do you have to say about that point? It's incorrect. It's incorrect. Why? Because it is throwing off bounds, so the y is not greater than the x. And it's not equal to it either. Yeah, it's right? not equal to, and it's not, gre and it's not greater, so it throws it off bounds. This y right here, with this particular x of 0, is, is equal. This y is the same as what you get when you plug in 0. This y from this point is less than what you would get if you plug in 0 for x. And this point has a y that's bigger than the y you get when you plug in 0 for x. And this point has a y that's bigger, and this point has a y that's bigger. And all the points, any point that's above this point, will have a y that's bigger than when you plug in x at 0. And that works for any of the points on the line. So the greater than part is all of these points. Any point that's above a point on this line will have a y that's bigger than what you get when you plug in that x. So I go to this x. If I put that particular x into this expression, if I put that in x into the expression, I'll get this y. It'll be exactly the same on both sides if I look at that point. At any point above that, the y value will be bigger than what I get for this x, whatever this x is. Okay, does that make sense? Did you do that problem justice? Helps, helps you out, you getting it? Not, let me know. All right, at number 18. This is the same idea, it's just that the equation, not the equation, the inequality is set up a little bit differently. This too has the equals two part. We care about all the points that make both sides equal, the x's and y's that make both sides equal. paying attention this whole time, we know that if we were to replace this inequality sign with an equals sign, all the points, x's and y's, that make both sides equal will also make a line. In this case, we'll also get a line when we plot all those points. And that's not always the case, because if I do 2x squared plus 5y equals negative 10, now that's a completely different shape altogether. Okay? That graph will have a completely different shape. It won't have a straight line shape. But since x and y are both to the first power, then we know that we're going to have a line when we graph all the solutions. So we know it's going to be line. We need at least two points. What two points can we find really quickly? Or how do we find those points really quickly? Okay. Plug in 0 for x. 0 for x. <laughs> 0 for x gives us 5y equals negative 10, and y will be negative 2. And what else? 0 for y. And we get uh, x equals negative, by the way, putting x equals is kind of redundant. It's in the x column, it's negative 5. So those are 2.0, negative 2. Okay, 0 for x and negative 2 for y. Well, Make both sides equal. Both sides are going to be equal when we do that. And 5, negative 5, 0. Negative 5 for x and 0 for y will make both sides equal. And any point that's a part of this line, same thing. If I take that x and that y, both sides will be equal. Color code that. That's all of these points satisfy the equals 2 part. Well, how do I find all the points that satisfy the less than? If you look at this inequality, it's set up uh, to choose the shaded area in a really easy way. I just want the y values that are bigger than anything I get over here. Well, those are the y is vertical, right? So the bigger ones will be up. 
Well, this one is not set up that way. It's not y is less than or y is greater than. So we could solve for y, get y on one side, and, and then decide what, where we would shade. Or Jethro? If you take the point 0, 0, uh -huh. and then you plug them in for x and y, if uh -huh. it makes the same in truth, then you know everything above the line has to be true. Very nice. So if, sorry, if, if I pick 0, 0 and put it in here, and it's true, like this side is less than that side, then I know that this point came from the shaded area. If it doesn't make it true, I know it came from the blank area, the not shaded area. So we get 0 plus 0, 0. Is that less than or equal to negative 10? No, 0 is bigger than negative 10. So this point didn't come from the shaded area, so the shaded area must be down here. Pick that point of zero, zero, and test it. If it's true, then it was from the shaded area. If it's not true, then it's from the not shaded area. If you go back to this one, you could do the same thing here if you want. Okay. I just think it's a little easier. It's, it's pretty obvious why it needs to be bigger values in this case. If I take zero, zero, I put zero there and zero there. Is zero greater than, well, this is, this is gone, negative two? Yeah, it is, so we just choose the shaded area. Abby? How come on number 18, why does negative 5 make y 0? On the x and y. Why does negative 5 make y 0? Yeah. Far right is 0. Far right. Are you here? Yeah. Well, if we try it, I mean, 2 times negative 5 uh, plus, we're just looking at the, the line, so that's just the equals 2 part, plus 5y equals negative 10. This is negative 10 plus 5y equals negative 10. And then if I solve for y, I add 10 to both sides. 5y equals 0, so y would have to be 0 for that to work. And even if you just like go right back here, negative 10 plus something is negative 10, so that has to be 0. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what this says. And it's not that we plug negative 5 in for x, we plug 0 in for y. circles in my book. Sometimes I'll, I'll assign one that's not circled, but usually I don't. So uh, if somebody loves number seven, we could do number seven, but uh, also we could do other ones. Like 22, which was assigned. 3g plus 14 equals seven. I wonder if the number, oh wait, not seven, 17. I'll do 22 and then we'll do 17. So 22, solve, and just, just solve. Graph. All right, so absolute value means the distance from zero, right? So I can take the absolute value of seven. Well, seven is a seven away from zero, so the absolute value is seven. You take the absolute value of negative seven, and you get seven, because negative seven is also seven away from zero. So since we don't know what g is, g could cause the inside to be 7. So this could be 7. Or we could find some g, we plug it in there, we do the math, and it comes out to be negative 7. So 3g um, plus 14 comes out to be negative 7. solve and we find the g that will make the inside 7 and we find this g value which will make the inside negative 7 and those are the two ways that we can take the absolute value of something and get 7. Subtract 14 
subtract 14 here too. Here we're going to get negative 7. 3g equals negative 7. Here we're going to get 3g equals negative 21. Divide by 3, divide by 3g equals negative 7 thirds. And here, g equals negative 7. So these are the two values of g that will, one, cause the inside to be 7, or cause the inside to be negative 7. Either way, the absolute value of those numbers is both 7. 17 times 7. Is that right? Absolute value of n plus 9 is equal to 10. So n plus 9 uh, could be equal to 10, or n plus 9 could be equal to negative 10. So we subtract 9, subtract 9, n could be 1, n could be negative 19. So it's to graph it. So here's 0, here's 1, so n could be 1, or it could be So the same thing holds true. We can still take this step inside the absolute value and set it equal to this side. We can take this step and set it equal to the opposite. Because either way you take the absolute value, you get x. If x is going to be some number and 3x minus 4 can be equal to the positive of that or equal to the negative of that. And four, three x equals x plus four, subtract x, two x equals four x equals two. Add x, four, four x equals four. Now we need to check our solution. You always know you need to check your solution if your other side of the equation that doesn't have absolute value has an x in it. Because if that side with an x in it comes out to be negative, then it would be impossible. It would be extraneous. It would not be possible to solve that equation. So really all you need to do is take this number, plug it into the right side, and make sure it comes out to be positive because the absolute value of something needs to be positive. So that would have, it would have to come out to be 2, the absolute value of 3 times 2 minus 4, does it equal to, well it's 6 minus 4, and that is 2, the absolute value of 2 is 2. But I knew that was going to happen, because I, I saw, I made sure that, that this expression was equal to this number, so what's inside the absolute value will come out to be 2, of course, to set it up that way. I just need to make sure that when I take the absolute value, I get a positive number. So all you really have to do is plug this guy into the right side and make sure that the right side is positive. And in both cases, positive. Positive 2, positive 1. The idea here is the same, it's just that we want that quantity to be bigger than 14. We don't want it to be equal to 14, we want it to be bigger than 14. So naturally, 5z plus 1 itself could be bigger than 14. It could be some number of 14.1, uh, 14.5, 14 15, 16, 25, 300. If this expression comes out to be anything that's bigger than positive 14, 
then the absolute value will be bigger than 14, right? But other kinds of numbers, when I take the absolute value of them, will be bigger than 14. 15. Sure, 15. We covered all those numbers that are bigger than 14. Are there any other numbers that when I take the absolute value of them, they come out to be bigger than 14? The number is lower than negative 14. Lower than negative 14, right? If I take the absolute value of negative 15, for example, is that bigger than 14? It is. 15 is bigger than 14. So if 5z plus 1 is less than negative 14, negative 14, negative 15, negative 16, negative 17, and so on, if that winds up being inside the absolute value, I take the absolute value of that negative number as positive, and that winds up being bigger than positive 14. comes out to be bigger than 14, or this comes out to be less than negative 14, those are the solutions. 5z is greater than 13. z is greater than, so z is bigger than 13 over 5, then this guy here, this whole expression, the absolute value will be bigger than 14. 5z is less than negative 15. z is less than is less than negative 3, then this thing right here will be negative 14 or smaller than that. And the absolute value of that will be bigger than positive 14. And just to graph the solution. So z can be like a range of things. We want to find out is it like an and or is it or? Can it be between two numbers or is it like some up here and some over here? Here's negative 3, 0, 1, 2, 3. It can't be equal to negative 3, so we'll put an open circle, but it could be less than negative 3. And 13 fifths, 5, 10, 15, 13 fifths, right there. But it can't be equal to it, so we'll put an open circle, but it can be bigger than 13 fifths. Still, four. So we've seen inequalities before. We've graphed inequalities, compound inequalities, and four. Since this can't be between, it can't be less than negative three and bigger than thirteen fifths at the same time. Like one number can't satisfy both of those things. We say it's four. Right, Sixty-two. Very similar to this previous problem, only it's not absolute value, inequality sign, number. So to make it that way, we'll subtract 4 from both sides, and we can approach it exactly the same way. If this stuff is greater than or equal to 8, if the stuff inside is greater than or equal to 8, then the absolute value will be greater than we got those negative numbers. We can take the absolute value of negative numbers and get positive numbers. If this stuff comes out to be negative, uh, yeah, if this comes out to be negative 8, it comes out to be negative 9, negative 10, negative 11, the absolute value of all those, all those numbers, are bigger than 8, or equal to 8. So if this comes out to be less than or equal to negative 8, it will also work, because then we have numbers that are farther than 8 away. Greater than 
10 are equal to 40. And there's all those numbers, all those numbers are submissions. 2 fifths n less than or equal to, we add it to both sides and it's 0, so n needs to be less than or equal to 0. There's zero, there's 40, way up there, there's 20, and 40. Uh, if it can be equal to zero, we'll shade that in. It needs to be also less than zero, so we'll shade that in. 40, it can be equal to 40, or it can be greater than 40, so there's a graph for those conditions. If you have questions, ask them. If not, then pass in your homework slash pink slips. Sure that you have one piece of paper, not a notebook full of paper. Calculator if you like it. Pencil or pen, that's good. Graph inequality. To help us graph this inequality, we always want to think about this graph. This graph is a line. If I find all the points that make both sides equal, we'll get a line. Put in 0 for x, I get the y-intercept, 0, 3, 0 for x, 3 for y. And then something that's easy to plug in for x, since there's no, well, the denominator is 1 for the slope, it would be really easy to plug in 1 or 2 or 3, it doesn't really matter what we plug in for x, any whole number will do. So 3 times 1 is 3 plus 3, 6, so 1 gives us 6, or y-intercept is 3, we go up 3, and to the right one following the slope. So far so good? Oh, it's dotted. What's that? Dotted line. Should be a dotted line. Why should it be a dotted line? It doesn't do that. Because we don't want the points that make both sides equal. We don't want them. We don't care about them. They, where they would be is helpful because it tells us where to stop because it says if you come to this line, both sides of this thing will be equal, and you don't want them to be equal. You want them to be unequal. So we a dotted line. Who said that was supposed to be dotted? There's a couple people here. A couple yeah. people. Was Bridger one of those? Yeah. yeah. Why don't we want those points? Why should we be dotted? Because we don't want the points that make both sides equal. We want them to be unequal. Unequal. So I plug in a particular x. What y will I get? Well, it depends on which x. The y that I get, I can find on this line. Plug in this x, I get this y. Plug in this x, I get this y. If I plug in this x and get this y, okay, where will I find the y's that I want? I want y's that are less than that, less than what I would get. Any particular x. Where are they? They're below. Below this point, below this point, below this point, everything, below every point that makes up that line. That's us. Those are the ones we want. Positive. 
positive. Positive 9 in there, I take 6 minus 27, I'm going to get negative 21. Absolute value of negative 21 is 21. process is going to be very similar between this and this, but at the end we're going to have to do what with this? Um, what? Check the solution. Check. How did you know we're supposed to check solution? Because there's X on both sides. There's X on the, on the non-absolute value side. So, 3X plus 2 could be equal to 2X minus 12. Pretty obvious. But a 3X plus 2 could also be equal to the opposite of what 2x minus 12 comes out to be. Minus 12 minus 2x minus 2x, x plus 2 equals negative 12. Subtract 2, subtract 2, x equals negative 14. Distribute the negative first, negative 2x plus 12. Subtract 2, add 2x. 5x equals 10, x equals 2. Okay, try it, right? Plug them in, we see if it works. What do we find out when we try it? They both come out negative on the on this side. 2 times negative 14 minus 12, that's negative 28, minus 12, negative 40. Well, that's not possible. I can't take the absolute value of the left side and wind up with negative 40. So this is not a solution. We plug in 2. 2 times 2 is 4, minus 12 is negative 8. Same thing. I can't take the absolute value of the left side and wind up with negative 8, like the right side winds up being. So what do we say about this equation? No solution. No solution. I have any solutions that work. It's not possible. In both cases, the right side would have to be negative. If you have questions, ask away. If not, then uh, I score it. Pass it back. Let me pass it to the Has anyone seen this kind of notation before? Yes. Answer should yeah. be yes. If not, then you forgot, or somebody didn't teach you, which I doubt the second is true. Okay. Maybe you forgot. That's okay. We're gonna we're gonna talk about this notation. It's called the function notation, and uh, it's it's useful. It might be a little confusing at first, but you'll get used to it. It's not that difficult. <clears throat> so let's go back to before function notation. That would be when we write y equals. So I should show you that when, I, when you see that f parentheses x, it's the same thing as y. It just represents what the output of the function is, just like y does. Let's say I have another function. 3 fourths x plus 7. Let's say I have another function. y equals negative 5 eighths x plus 4. We've got three functions up there. To help you see why we use function notation, why somebody bothered to invent function notation, I'm going to come over here, away from the board, okay, just to kind of illustrate one of the purposes of function notation. I'm standing over here, remotely, and I say, um, put in 4 for x. Do you have any questions for me? What's that now? Which one? Which one? This is exactly the right question. Which one? Uh, I didn't specify. Okay, especially if I said something like put 4 in for x into the function. Right? Put 4 into the function. Which function is the function you're talking about? Right? Understood? Yeah. yeah. So if I say put x into the function, or put 4 in for x in the function, you say which function? And that's a good question to ask. So that's the first thing about function notation is it makes it easy to talk about functions by giving functions names, just like we give people names. Okay? There's lots of different ways that I could 
distinguish these functions from each other. We'll just throw some ideas out there. What's, what's one idea of how I could make it so that I could stand away from the board and say, make it clear that I want you to use that function? What's that? FF1, FF2, FF3. Well, we haven't gotten F of, F of X yet. We got Y. Y1, Y2. Y1, Y2. Okay, so I could do it that way, Nathan? Um, could you change x to another variable like y or z? Oh, sure, I could change. I could do uh, x. Uh, I could do like three fourths y or uh, or not y, but I could do z. this is uh, t, and then if you said z, yeah, you can make this z. Okay, and that that's kind of really the idea behind function notation. It's just that the function. When we say the function, we're really talking about the output. Because the output of the function is the important thing. Pretty much all functions have the same inputs, right? In one, but in two, but in three, that's kind of boring. But how, what makes di functions different from each other is the outputs that we give you depending on which x you put in, right? I put in four into one of the functions, I get something different from what I get from the other function and from the other function, probably. Because I have this pretty unique set of outputs, things that they get out if given certain inputs. So, Nathan's kind of done with the inputs, what we're going to do with the, the variable that represents the output. We're going to change it so that they're different. So that they're different from just y and y and y. They're just kind of different names. Okay. We could change their colors. We could say the middle one. We could say the right one. We could say the first, second, and third one. We could do y and one, y two, y three. We could do all of these things. Or, Instead of using y for all the functions, we'll use f or g, h, y, f, what do you think? It's a function. function. It's a function. So f, function starts with f, use f, the letter f to represent uh, a function. And then G and H because well, uh, those are the next in the alphabet. Okay. And you can name it anything you want, but F, G, and H, usually you don't work with more than three functions in one setting. If I work with a function in problem number one, and it's F of X, well I could just call the problem, the, the, the function in, in number two, F of X, because it's just a completely different problem. But if in problem one I'm working with two different functions, I want to work with f of x and g of x. The function I call f and the function I'll call g. It just have names. So now I can say plug four in into the function g. Plug four into the function g. What do we get if we put four into the function g? Ten. Ten? Everybody agree ten? Four. Three fourths times four, fourths cancel, three. 3 plus 7 is 10. So it gives, them, gives them names so we can talk about them and can distinguish them one from another. The other thing we do, since we're already changing things up, we'll also put this parentheses for each one of these. And I'll say it once, and I'll say it twice, and I'm sure I'll say it a bunch of times, that this F parentheses, or G parentheses, or A parentheses, does not mean multiply. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't mean multiply. It doesn't mean f times anything. It doesn't mean g times anything. It doesn't mean h times anything. And I know that that can be confusing, but it's just a difference of context. In the context of functions and function notation, f of x means a function named f whose input is x. What's the second one? H of, or sorry, G of? T. T is the input here. G of T. It's a function of T. When you say something, if you say G is a function of T, it means G, the output, G, is caused by, is a result of T. And this is? H of function h, it's called h, function of z, meaning that z is the input. Simple idea. Um, does 
this mean f times negative 3? No. Okay. Once again, no, it doesn't. It doesn't mean f times negative 3. What does it mean? It means that f, f of negative Yes, it means f of negative, the value of the function f at negative 3. If you put in negative 3, you get out f. If you put in negative 3, you get out f. Yeah, f. And, and f will be some number, right, in that case. f of negative 3 will be some number. We're not solving for f. Right? There's not going to be a come, come a time where we divide by negative 3 on both sides and solve for f. Because that's not what this means. It's not f times negative 3. It's f, the value of the function f, when you plug in negative 3. 2 times negative 3 times 3. We just take that. You see x has been replaced with negative 3, so x needs to be replaced with negative 3. What was that? Negative 6 minus 3, negative 9. f of negative 3 is negative 9. The reason why we use that notation is it's kind of a mouthful. It's kind of a, a long sentence that we represent with all these uh, symbols. This is saying, for the function named f, when you put negative 3 into it, you get out negative 9. <coughs> for the value of the function f at x equals negative 3 is a negative 9. No matter how you try to say it out loud, it's kind of a long sentence. But f of negative 3 is negative 9 means all of that. So it's basically just another way to like notate like an in and out table basically. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Uh, where we might have used to do this, uh, negative 3, negative 9. This is the same thing, just showing me I put negative 3, and even more specifically I put it into f, that function right there, not this one and not this one, but that one, and I got out negative 9. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was short. So f of 3 is negative 9. Okay. Here, I want you to do these two on your own. What is g of 12 and h of negative 16? I want you to find both of those. Just whatever you see in the parentheses there, just plug it into the input and see what happens. So if I ask you g of 12, you know you're working with function g, not the function h. That's the first thing about function notation, is a name. It gives it a name. If I put 12 in there, it means I'm going to put 12 in for x. 4 times 12 for 1. Yeah, so we get 3, 7, 9 plus 7, 16. What do we say? We say g of 12 is 16. g of 12 <coughs> is 16. It means Function g, if I plug in whatever the input is called, if I plug in 12, I get out 16. Here, I know I'm working with the function h. h of negative 16 means plug in at negative 16 to the input. Negative 16 over 1, we get the cancellation here, we get the 2, 4, so we get negative 5, negative 2, so positive 10, plus 4, 14. So h of negative 16 is 14. We all agree? 16, 14? Any mistakes on my part? Good? Okay. Um, what if I say g of x equals 19? How do we figure that out? How do we figure out what x brought it to 19? Replace g of x with 19 and solve for x in the original equation. Oh, sorry, I put x when it should have been t. But yes, replace this, the output, with 19. 19 equals 3 fourths t plus 7 and solve for t. That's what you said, right? I'm not mistaken. Subtract 7, and 12 
equals three fourths t and t. If we multiply by three fourths, three four so sixteen. I did four thirds in my head. I said three fourths maybe, but I did multiply by four thirds. Yeah. So the difference between g of 12 equals something, that means what's the output? Put 12 in, what is the output? That's what this means. g of t is 19, that means something got plugged in for t. We don't know what yet, we do know that we got 19 as the result. So that's function notation. G of x, g of t, f of t, h of z, whatever. That all just means y. It all just means the output. This means the output when you put in 12. This means the output is 19. I don't know what I put in, so I'll just have to figure that out. I'll figure that out with 16. Okay. So now function notation leads us to something called a piecewise function. function that's defined in pieces. Just cut into pieces. Normally a function is not cut into pieces. Normally a function is just, here's a function, g of t is 3 fourths t plus 7. If you want to plug something into g, just plug it in here, right there. Always just take it and multiply by 3 fourths and you add 7. A piecewise function is into pieces like this. Let's say f of x equal to x plus one. I'll just I'll just write if uh, x is less than or equal to negative two equal to negative five x plus seven if x is greater. No problem for us if we've been paying attention and, and thinking to ourselves, what's a function? Well, what, what is a function? There's this thing called a function. Put something in and get something out. Put something in and get something out. Right? Simple as that. Put something in and you get something out. So here's the question. If I want to know f of 4 is, what does its notation mean? What am I going to be doing with 4? Four for x, exactly. Four for x. That's what it means. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the question: Do I put four in here and in here? That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, right? I don't want two different outputs. Okay. Which one do you think we're going to put four into? to choose one of the functions, only one of them. Which one should it be? Step up to the bottom one. Why? Because x has to be greater than negative 2 and 4 is. Yes, 4 is greater than negative 2, and if x is greater than negative 2, which 4 is, you use this one. That's all piecewise function means. Okay? For these x's, use this function. For these x's, use these functions. For this function. If you look at the graph of it, at negative 2, at x is negative 2, cut up the x's. These x's will use one function, these x's will use another function. If we want to know what f of 4 is, we just go here and use this one. f of 4 is negative 5 times 4. 7 is negative 20 plus 7. F of 4 is negative 13. F of 4 is, let's call this negative 13. How about F of 0? Which one do we use when we want to plug 0 in for x? Top. Which one? Top. 
Why the top one? It's going to be less than. Uh, wait, hold on. Okay, the bottom one. The bottom one, because zero is greater than negative two. Zero is greater than negative two. So we're going to use this one here. What are we going to get? Zero for x into the swing, it's seven. Uh, seven is going to be right about there. Zero, seven. And I know this, this thing, if I were to graph this, just this would be a line, right? So I can just connect these two points. But then when I get here, to x is negative two, it switches to the other function, right? Make sense? Mm -hmm. so it switches over to the other function. So I'll give myself a little open circle. Why an open circle at that part of the graph? It's, it's not equal to. Equal. It's not equal to. Right? Not equal to negative 2. When x is negative 2, we'll use this function. Okay. So f of negative 2. How do I figure out what f of negative 2 is? Where do I plug negative 2 in for x? The top one. The top one, because x is less than or equal to negative 2. It's like equal to negative 2 at that point. Negative two plus one, that's negative five. F of negative two is negative five. So here's negative two, let's call this negative five. And I'll draw a closed circle. Because that's the value of the function at two. When x is two. <coughs> so what do I, I I have a point. I know the slope. Slope is 3 over 1. So I can go down 3 to negative 8. Down 3 to the left 1. So how would I evaluate a piecewise function? First, I have to figure out, well, what x are they asking me to plug in? All right, I know that x. Which, which function do I use? Piecewise functions should always be cut up like perfectly. There shouldn't be any overlap. Does that mean any overlap? Whoever wrote that down wrote it down wrong. Right? There's no overlap. Right? It's not x is less than or equal to negative 2 and x is greater than or equal to negative 2. Negative 2 only belongs to one function. One of the functions from the piecewise function. Let's try this again, but more, more on your own. Instead of if, I'll just put a comma. X is less than or equal to negative over four. X is not f. bigger than negative four. see what's going on here and remind you of what we just talked about. You see how x, like, we have a function to use when x is less than or equal to negative 4. We have a function to use when x is greater than negative 4. So once we get past negative 4, we're going to jump over to this function for less than 6 or equal to 6. And once we get past positive 6, when x is bigger than 6, we'll use this third function. What I want to know from you is what is h of 0 and what is h of 6. Two different things. I want you to find those two things. Okay. So when we have a piecewise function and, and we're supposed to evaluate it for a certain value of x, figure out what the f function is worth, the output, when we put in a certain input, we have to decide which of the functions are we going to use. We don't put in all three. Only one function will take any particular x. So which function do we use for h of 0 to plug 0 in for x? Okay. 
Why the second one? right in between those two values. So we'll use that one, we'll do negative 4 thirds times 0 plus 3, that's three. h of 0, three. Okay. How about for h of 6? Yeah? Use the second one again because it's equal to again, 6. It's very, it's right on the edge of the x's that we would use the second function for, but yeah, we would use uh, the second function. So negative 4 thirds times 6, plus three, get cancellation there, get negative four times two plus three, negative eight plus three, negative five. H of six is negative five. If you wanted to graph this, it just as splitting up the graph for all the values of x that we've been given. We'll go to negative 4. One, two, three, four. We'll go to positive 6. These dotted lines aren't actually part of the graph. The dotted lines aren't parts of the graph. They're just helpful guidelines. So, in between negative 4 and 6, right here, that would be this function. What's the graph of this function look like? What shape is it? It's a line. It's got a y-intercept of 3. It's got a slope of negative 4 thirds. x's that are less than negative 4, I don't use that function anymore. For x's that are bigger than 6, I don't use that function anymore. Do I put a closed circle or an open circle here? Closed, because when x is 6, that is the function that I use. But when x is negative 4, don't use that function for x is negative 4 exactly. When x is negative 4 exactly, use this function. figure out what's going on there, where this graph is, I'll just I'll plug in negative 4 into the function, it was the y value, and then follow the slope from there. So I'll put in negative 4, 3 fourths, and negative 4 over 1, minus 5, and so we'll get negative 3 minus 5, negative 8. x's that are less than negative 4, we just keep on going forever in the negative direction, using this graph right here. And on this side, when x is just past 6, when it's bigger than 6, we're going to use this other function. So, let's see, when it's 6 there, we get 5 6 times 6 minus 9, which is 5 minus 9, that's negative 4. circle right there. Follow the slope of 5, 6. Up 5 and over 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then we can draw our line. Oh, we just have a few problems today. <coughs> so this problems from page 900. No, not 900. What page was it? It's at the end of the previous text, but I'll send it out again. Page numbers one through five. Oh, Thirty-one. Was that? Thirty-one. One thirty-one. One thirty-one. Page one thirty-one. One through five. That's what it is. I'll also send out the text here. Thanks for the day. Could you the little fourth grade? A little bit of fourth grade.